It is a real honour to be able to be the warm-up act this afternoon for uh, our final speaker. Um, before I introduce you to her, I'm going to take you back two weeks to a, the top of a very, very beautiful temple uh, called Angkor Wat uh, in Cambodia. For the cultured among us, you will know this as the place where Tomb Raider was filmed. <laughs> And no, I was not looking for the next Lara Croft. I was um, actually there to visit a little project that I help um, called the Angkor Hospital for Children. It's a remarkable place. Um, it does some incredible work. It's, it's actually a, a leading centre for understanding antimicrobial resistance and more importantly also about what we can achieve with basically no money. In the middle are a couple of cases that I'd like to just describe to you. One on the left is a child with retinoblastoma. When they take your child when they're born in the UK and they flash a little light in the eye and they see the red reflex, um, that's, when they, that's when they're testing to see whether there's anything bad growing in the back of the eye. They don't do this in Cambodia, which is why there's an absolute epidemic of blindness, which unfortunately results mostly in the children having their eyes amputated. Um, on the right is a child who is a leukemia patient receiving chemotherapy. And they are both at a leading centre for cancer treatment in Cambodia. In fact, they are at the only paediatric cancer treatment center in Cambodia that treats 30 children a year. That is all. The reason why is because chemotherapy is too toxic. You can't send the kids home. There is no infrastructure. It is not that they don't have the drugs. It's that the drugs we have invented do not fit the infrastructure. And this is not a problem just for Cambodia, of course. This is a problem for all poor countries, and indeed, it is also a problem for every country. We invent stuff all the time with, broadly speaking, overall survival, progression-free survival as our overall objective, but not at how easily it can be accessed by everybody. We think of the social justice of the things that we invent in medicine as an afterthought. They do brilliant work at the Angkor Hospital for Children, and in fact they are really turning this around with an incredibly small budget. Question is, are we doing the same in our world? About a year ago, um, the gentleman with the hat here in the middle um, he had just sold his gene sequencing company to a very large biopharma company and he was on his cycling machine at home and he collapsed. And he phoned me up from Stanford, the hospital, and he said, I have been diagnosed with glioblastoma just a few weeks after the success of starting a company and selling it. He obviously has a brilliant amount of access to some incredible people and he was on the other side of the coin. He had no limits to what he could access. He gene sequenced his tumour, um, he gene sequenced every cell or sample of cells in his tumour. He understood the metabolomics of his tumour, he understood more about his tumour than we do in most mouse models. And he really developed a deep understanding with a bunch of computational biologists um, and friends to understand what combinations of therapies might work for this fatal disease. It kills almost everybody within 12 to 24 months. It is essentially incurable. He also sponsored Stanford to develop a pioneering new circulating tumour DNA assay so everything that he was trying uh, could be monitored to see what the DNA burden was doing and whether anything that he was trying was, was working. And today he stands, even though not all of the tumour was removed, he stands as somebody with zero 
identifiable tumour mass in his brain and zero circulating tumour DNA. He is effectively cured. However, he is not the same as everybody. He represents the very, very future uh, of perhaps what we will be looking at with combinations of immunotherapies, metabolic therapies, combination targeted therapies, multi-epitope vaccines, a lot of the stuff that's being thought about and developed in the floors above us right now. A friend of his called me up um, a, few, a few months ago, about six months ago, and said, there's somebody who you might be able to help navigate as well, um, because she has also been diagnosed with glioblastoma. Um, for anyone that knows me, I'm, I'm not particularly good when it comes down to famous people outside of the world of science. So when I came to meet this uh, lady just around the corner from my home, I went home afterwards and I said to my wife, Marge, um, I think this lady's actually quite famous. And uh, she said, who is it? And I said, well, uh, her name's Tessa Jowell. Of course she's famous. She's the person who, who, who raised the money for the Olympics and has done a great deal in politics. So I felt like a bit of a goon because I didn't even know if she was Labour or Tory. I'm not sure whether I actually said that when I met her, but uh, fortunately, um, we, 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 we started, help, started to help her look at the options that were available. And what was incredibly striking to me, um, and this is a picture here of her, Jess, her daughter, uh, and her granddaughter here, um, uh, Otty. Um, what, we, what, what really struck me about Tessa was that despite her having the same kind of access as my friend in, in Silicon Valley, the only thing that she was interested in is closing that gap between the people who have access and have money and have the ability to go beyond standard of care and those who don't irrespective of wherever they are in the world, the UK and beyond. And she started with Jess um, a movement which began in a truly epic debate in the House of Lords, um, which led to what currently is quite an extraordinary gathering of forces from all over the world, and it's the UK government-led international brain cancer mission uh, to try and find, finally, some kind of progress towards a cure for what is still currently an incredibly difficult disease. But not only to find those cures for the billionaires, but actually make that accessible to the billions. It's called ACT. ACTs are kind of different to the way we study medicine today. Um, we, we use gold standard science in randomised controlled trials. But now we're, we're realising that complex systems need to be studied also with the help of adaptive clinical trials as well. Um, and the mathematics around that is really quite interesting, um, but slowly people are getting together and starting with brain cancer, um, adaptive clinical trials, and eventually um, adaptive clinical treatments for everybody are the aim of this mission. Um, Tessa was supposed to be uh, with us today, uh, as well as Jess, to talk about the role of ACT um, and the mission. Uh, unfortunately, she couldn't be here because she had to go to hospital. Uh, but she did um, send this message this morning for all of us. This is a short and moment of pleasure to feel that we are working together. Uh, today, sadly, I have to be uh, f focused on my t treatment uh, and you are all uh, tr training the world. And I look forward so much for being part of that with you and very, backly, uh, very, very quickly uh, back there. So she's currently at the Marsden, but uh, I think we should both give her and Tess, as we, uh, Jess, as we welcome her on stage, a round of applause. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for welcoming me to speak today. My name is Jess Mills. I am co-founder of ACT. 
and daughter of Tessa Jell. My mum is one of the most fearless, courageous, change-making women of her generation. And on the 24th of May last year, was rushed to hospital after suffering two major seizures and was subsequently diagnosed with a grade 4 glioblastoma and the left temporal lobe of her brain. Nothing can prepare a patient or a family for a diagnosis like glioblastoma. Even for a family of staunch optimists like my own, when presented with a medium prognosis of 14 months and a standard of care which offers no hope for longer term survival or quality of life, we were cast off into a landscape that felt impossibly dark and utterly hopeless. The adjustment to the new reality for families is nothing short of devastating. And in the face of such hopelessness, it's very easy just to become catatonic, totally disorientated by grief, and a disbelief that this could happen to the person most central to your universe. However, what we didn't know at this point was that we were already at the, at the lucky end of an awful spectrum. As the news of mum's diagnosis became known to friends and colleagues, suddenly we found ourselves under the guidance and advice as some of the leading global ex experts in neuro-oncology and medical innovation, many of whom make up the incredible Eliminate Cancer Initiative, and also a certain Dr. Jack Reinler. I will never forget the first meeting we had with Jack, and he said, I know this feels hopeless, but I promise you, a glioblastoma diagno diagnosis now is not even what it was two years ago. There's so much more that we know and so much more that can be done. And in one moment, it felt like that low ceiling was removed. And in the coming days, a galaxy of other options was revealed to us. In order to pursue many of these options, having tumour sample was essential. Every tumour is uniquely different, and understanding the key drivers of the tumour soon after diagnosis allows a more targeted, precise and effective approach when considering potential treatments from the beginning. So much of what we've been able to do for my mum since then has been because her tumour was flash frozen post-surgery and not because it was a compulsory part of the protocol but, but purely by chance because she had an excellent surgeon. It's nothing short of a tragedy that patients and families could miss out on this opportunity to extend both survival and improve quality of life essentially because of an administrative oversight. So on a very practical level we have already urged the government and NHS for there to be immediate change to the protocol to mean that all patient, patients' tumours are flash frozen post-surgery. This is not only essential with regards to enabling gene sequencing and consequently accessing more personalised treatments, but also key to enabling deeper and broader research. We are delighted to say that this, being, this is being actively implemented as we speak for glioblastoma, but should also be implemented for all forms of complex cancer. Once we knew mum's genomic data, everything from nutraceuticals to repurposed medications to off-label cancer drugs could be recommended, many of which, when used in combination, have shown evidence of patients hugely outliving their prognosis and with good quality of life. Of course, the NHS operates as it has to, with a narrow financial limit and within a strict ethical framework. But the fact is, if you look outside those limits, all sorts of innovative, sophisticated treatments are being pioneered and used with promising success. So it didn't take us long to identify that our greatest chances lay way outside the system. And with next to no willingness or support from our team here at the time, it was clear that we were going to have to fight tooth and nail to access these other treatment options ourselves. The daily reality of this is a surreal one. For a person with absolutely no medical background at all, I'm a musician, I found myself chasing down chief medical officers from big farmers, trying to persuade them to accept our compassionate applications for off-label EGFR inhibitors. But do we go for afatinib or lapatinib, dipatuxuzizumab or tagrisso? Yeah, your guess is as good as mine. But lucky for us, by virtue of the incredible professional network mum had developed during her career, we have by this point managed to assemble a team of global advisors who are collaborating and consulting with each other to try and reach a consensus on what we should go for. 
Creating a consensus across many teams, institutions and time zones is a complex process to manage, but it has enabled us to move forward with a supported analysis of potential outcomes and potential risks. Risk. Here is a very key word in terms of navigating patient experience. Yes, there's a risk. Of course there is. But, there, but it is one you are prepared to take because the risk of doing nothing is far greater. The risk of doing nothing with glioblastoma is that you will surely die within months, not years. But even if you are prepared to take that risk, how could patients without this network of support possibly navigate this on their own? Beyond the standard of care, for most patients is the current model of randomised controlled trials. And the broad focus being on the advancement of science means that we are forgetting about the most important thing of all, which is access. In not prioritising access to treatments, we are forgetting about the patient, our mothers, our brothers, our children, our partners, and the best friends to all of us. The consequence of this is the highest price there is to pay. Patients die, and they quite possibly are dying much sooner than they would because the op options available to them are so limited. So one of the big questions we have to ask is how are we going to address the huge cancer inequalities that currently exist? As far as we're concerned, this is an issue of social justice. Surely we cannot accept a health system in this country where some will live, or at least live better, and others will die because of their privilege of access or lack of it. Addressing the huge cancer inequalities is at the core of our vision for the future and making adaptive collaborative treatments available to all patients post-diagnosis is a key way of enabling this. But no matter how excellent your consultants are, getting better outcomes is directly correlated to a patient or family's ability to stay on top of the multifarious practical things that need to be managed in the patient's best interests and your ability to turn advice into action. In jargon terms, this is the role of the patient advocate. It's a funny term, patient advocate. It sounds so formal, so professional, when actually it's anything but. It's the role that a daughter, mother, sibling or partner automatically and involuntary, involuntarily assumes in response to a devastating diagnosis of the person most central to their universe. It's a mission of love to do anything that is humanly possible to save the person that they love beyond description. Having a strong patient advocate is the thing that gets an expedited treatment process to taking weeks instead of months, days instead of weeks, and hours instead of days. This may sound neurotic in the extreme, but in the case of glioblastoma, these are tumours that can grow at a rate of a centimetre a month. So truly, every day counts. Patient advocacy is actually life-saving work. I often think about where we would be if we didn't have the benefit of the network of support we have managed to build both within us as a family and around us. And the answer is, mum might well not still be here with us. And then I think about the thousands and thousands of other families going through a similar thing, but without that support. And I feel desperately the need to change this for those who don't have the voice to do it for themselves. The only time I've seen my mum cry since she was diagnosed was last summer, after waiting for one of her radiotherapy appointments, having observed the waiting room of people and processing the brutal realisation that the fate of each person in that room had already been written by virtue of their privilege or lack of, and how that would enable them to go beyond the shocking limitations of the current standard of care. Her sense of mission was written in those, mo in those moments, and we both feel commissioned to transform patient access, and not just for the privileged few, but for all of us. She has never thought about herself, she has only thought about how we can change this for everyone else. And that is what ACT has been created to do. The future for better outcomes for patients is going to involve a complete
paradigm shift. We cannot rely on old models to create the solutions we need to see. We need to reimagine the future in a completely different way. So how do we change that? We need to empower oncologists and we need to empower patients. We need to completely reimagine the future to see a context where adaptive collaborative treatments or acts are available to everyone, irrespective of access or income, so that no stone is left unturned for the patient and for families. The policy and systems both need to be in place to make acts a reality, but that's what we're here to do. And this is not just for glioblastoma, this will be for all forms of complex cancer. With one in two of us now likely to face a diagnosis of cancer in their lifetimes, this is a mission that should bind us all together with a collective sense of purpose. Better, longer lives with cancer for all of us. Thank you.